All right, welcome everyone to this week's autonomy talk. This week is a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Somil Bansal, who is an assistant professor uh, at USC in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, something about Somil. Somil obtained a Bachelor in Technologies in Electrical Engineering from IIT Kanpur, and then a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from UC Berkeley. He then also obtained a PhD uh, uh, from ECS at UC Berkeley. And before joining USC, he spent a, a year as a research scientist at Waymo. Uh, so if you are in California, for instance, you see Waymo cars all, all over the place. So he was part of, of that group. Um, also, he has collaborated with a lot of companies. That's quite exciting. He will tell us more about it. Uh, companies such as Skydio, Google, Boeing, and, and NASA. Uh, and his research uh, is broadly interested in developing uh, mathematical tools and algorithms for control and analysis of city-critical autonomous systems. Uh, for these works, he has received a number of awards that you can, you can find in the bio. And today's talk is going to be about safety assurances for learning-enabled autonomous systems. This is, of course, very related to this seminar series, and I'm personally very excited to hear more about it. Therefore, I give you the stage, Solomon. Thank you, Joel. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. And, and before even, even before that, thank you so much for organizing this wonderful series. I have benefited a lot from it, both as a student and now as a faculty. So thank you for, thank you for starting this. Uh, and it is my pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, hello everyone, I'm Somil. I'm, I'm an assistant professor in the EC department at USC, where I lead the Safe and Intelligent Autonomy Lab. And if you were to summarize um, our, our lab goal in one sentence, uh, we are interested in developing robot algorithms that enable them to operate with guaranteed safety and performance in new and uncertain environments. Uh, so that includes applications such as autonomous drones uh, with Skydio, autonomous cars with Waymo, uh, autonomous aircrafts with Boeing, and uh, a number of lagged robots as well. And if we look at these systems, uh, machine learning and AI are becoming increasingly pervasive in their autonomy stacks, um, most notably for perception and trajectory forecasting, but also increasingly for planning and control. And for a number of good reasons, uh, machine learning and AI are really good at capturing the complexity of real world situations that the system must operate in, which could be otherwise very hard to model using traditional engineering domain knowledge. Um, but the inclusion of machine learning has also opened up a set of new challenges uh, on the safety side of things. So for example, if you're in Bay Area, you hear news such as cruise cars are being rolled back from the San Francisco city, um, a manipulator is confusing human with a box and unfortunately causing a death in this particular scenario. Uh, the situation is serious enough that the US government and many other governments such as in UK has passed an, passed an executive order to prioritize the discussion on AI safety, both for autonomy but AI more broadly. And so there is this tension that we have a lot in autonomy today, which is how can we design autonomous system that can leverage the capabilities offered by modern machine learning methods while also maintaining safety? And that's the question that we think about a lot in our lab. Um, but today in this talk, my goal is to dive a little bit deeper into the source of this tension. What's holding us back and what can we do about it? And so for instance, if you look at machine learning systems today, um, most of them are designed without any specific regard to the safety during the training process. And so when safety issues emerge in the design system, post hoc solutions are designed to counter these challenges. So for instance, if, if Waymo car is having a problem with, uh, with, uh, with tow trucks, then Waymo would ground its fleet, uh, they will update their software and then they will restart this fleet. Now, while this approach makes the design of learning based system much simpler, it is fundamentally flawed for a number of key reasons. Now, first of all, this approach of hand engineering safety solutions is simply not scalable with the number of safety risk the system will encounter in the real world situations. Um, second, these post hoc solutions are often conservative in nature because they act as bandages, which might then degrade the system performance. And finally, once we deploy the design system, it will continue to encounter new situations that it has never seen before. And so in these situations, the system must also need to adapt its safety behavior where the current hand engineered solutions fall short. So our core philosophy to overcome these challenges is to treat safety of learning based systems as a continuous process 
where safety is formally integrated in different stages of the learning cycle. For example, starting from their design and training to their deployment to iteratively improving the system safety based on the new data over its life cycle. And so more concretely, what that means is that for the design of learning based systems, we have been developing algorithms that programmatically incorporate safety requirements in the training process itself, so as to learn inherently safe and robust systems. Now, while design time methods are a step forward, as I mentioned earlier, a learning based system will continue to encounter new data and new situations. So we have been developing algorithms that can both detect these novel and anomalous situations and correspondingly adapt the system behavior in order to maintain safety. And finally, we work on closing this loop um, by developing algorithms that enable robotic systems to learn from their past failures in order to improve their safety and performance over time. So together, these advances provide us a continual safety assurance framework for learning based systems where safety assurances are provided provisionally during the design time, they are continuously monitored and adapted during the operation time, and they're continuously improved over the system's life cycle. Now, in the remaining time that I have, I want to go a little bit deeper into some of my work. I would in particular talk about how can we learn safe controllers from data? How can we adapt these controllers online based on the new deployment conditions? And how can we find the safety critical failures of a learned controller? Uh, by the way, let me take a quick pause here and just say that if you have any question at any point, just please uh, let me know. Um, you can put it also in the chat. Um, Joel has uh, kindly um, um, agreed to monitor the chat and he can he can relay the question to me. Maybe Sumil, this, uh, this, yeah. uh, in this spirit, Subrata asked uh, already a nice question. Maybe I'll ask it directly. Uh, yeah. Subrata asks, do you also factor life cycle assessment during the design stage? That's a very good question. And uh, the answer, it depends on the system. I mean, ideally, yes, we always want to do that. But uh, but one of the problems with the lifetime assessment is that um, that we may not know fully the kind of situations we will encounter in the real world. So it's it may not always be even possible to encounter for or, or to account for the full life assessment during the design time. I will, I will talk about this uh, in, in terms of concrete examples as I go further in the talk, but that's a very good question. All right, so um, let's start with focusing on learning safe controllers from data. Um, but even before I talk about learning safe controllers, let's take, a, let's take a step back and ask ourselves, what do we really even want out of safety analysis when we say safe learning based autonomous systems? I would say that we want two key things. First of all, we want to quantify which states are doomed to fail versus which states are safe to be in. And second, I want a controller that keep my system within this safe set, uh, um, right? And the good news is that control theory provides us a number of powerful frameworks for the safety analysis of autonomous systems. And in our work, we use one such framework quite frequently uh, called hamilton jacobi reachability analysis, which it turns out not only formalize these two requirements, but also provides us a way to automatically compute them. So for the next few minutes, let me talk about what hamilton jacobi reachability analysis is, how it can formalize these two requirements, and then I'm gonna bring back learning in the loop and talk about how we can use it for learning safe controllers. So, um, so in hamilton jacobi reachability analysis, we assume that the underlying autonomous system has some dynamics F with state X, control U, and disturbance D. You can think of disturbance here as the uncertainty in the system. So this could be unmodeled dynamics, for example, or the actual environment uncertainty that we may want to safeguard against. Now, given these dynamics, the key thing that we are interested in is the backward reachable tube of the system, which is the set of all initial states of a system from which, the, it will be, from which it will be ultimately driven to an undesirable set of states, which we sometimes also call the failure set, despite the best control effort. So let's try to understand what that means with the help of a very simple example. Uh, so consider a quad order moving longitudinally up and down in a room. So here the ceiling and the floor might represent that failure set that we don't want the quad order to crash into. The light red region here represents the backward reachable tube of the system, meaning that if the quad order starts at any state inside this set, then no matter what it does, it will eventually crash into the ceiling or the floor. 
The converse of this light red region is the blue region, which is the safe set for the system, meaning that if the quadrant starts at any state inside this set, then it has a control to keep it within this set at all times. So regionality analysis will provide us both this safe set, this blue set, as well as the corresponding safety controller to keep the system inside this set. So I'm going to talk about how we do that in reachability analysis. And so to compute these entities, we start with an implicit representation of our failure set with a function L of X, where L of X is negative inside the failure set and it's positive outside. We can also think of L of X as the safety reward the robot gets at, this, at state X. If we are inside the failure set, we get a negative reward. If we are outside the failure set, we get a positive reward. And there are many such reward functions that satisfy this definition, um, but the one that is used quite frequently in robotics is the sign distance function to the failure set, which is naturally negative inside the set and positive outside. Now, given this reward function, the cumulative reward of a robot trajectory is given by the minimum safety reward it encounters along the trajectory. So for example, if a trajectory ever enters into the failure set, this cumulative reward will be negative. Otherwise, the cumulative reward will be positive. Um, now, given this reward function, um, we formulate the BRT computation as a game between the disturbance and control. So disturbance, again, rep represents the uncertainty in the system, where the disturbance is attempting or forcing my system into the failure region. In other words, it's trying to minimize my reward, whereas the control is trying to keep me safe. In other words, it's trying to maximize this cumulative reward. The other way of saying that is we are interested in computing the value function corresponding to this game between the control and disturbance. And here the value function intuitively represents the closest the system will ever get to the failure set. So, for example, if the value function of a trajectory is negative, that means that no matter how hard control tried, it eventually got into the failure set. Whereas if the value function is positive, that means the trajectory of my system remained outside the failure set at all times. So essentially we can find the unsafe set or the backward reachable tube by simply looking at the states where the value function is negative. Um, and similarly, the safe set can be found by looking at the value function being positive. Okay, so this value function now can be computed using the principle of dynamic programming, which results into a Bellman backup or Bellman iteration. When we are in continuous time and state, this Bellman iteration is given by a partial differential equation, sometimes called hamilton jacobi isaacs partial differential equation. But very similar to the Bellman equation in discrete time, it relates the rate of the change in the value function to how taking a particular action might affect the system distance to the failure set. And so once we compute this partial differential equation, we get the value function. Here I'm showing you that value function corresponding to that simple quadrilateral example that I showed earlier. The red regions mean the value function is negative or, or smaller, and the blue means the value function is more and more positive. And so these reasons are where the system is very unsafe, whereas as the value function is more positive, the, value uh, the system is more safe. And the BRT or the unsafe set is uh, can be found by looking at the states where the value function is indeed negative, which in this case is given by this black boundary, which also corresponded to that light red region that I showed earlier. So that's how I computed that light red region. Now, along with the value function, reachability analysis also provides us a safety controller, which essentially or intuitively at any state X is just trying to push me towards higher and higher values, meaning towards more and more safety. So again, to summarize, um, reachability analysis is a formal way to characterize the safety of autonomous systems. It does so by computing this value function V, which is the result of a partial differential equation. Once we solve this V, uh, once we compute this V, it gives us both the safe set for the system, this blue set, as well as the safety controller. Samil, so, uh, yes. can, can I just interrupt you? Uh, of course, You yeah. have been talking about BRT. BRT is uh, the safety if, uh, a device, a function to bring it along, or it's an obstacle? How do you compare BRT and the obstacle? That's a very good question. So, uh, so in this case, for example, I think, again, it's easier to understand through this example. So ceiling and floor is the obstacle here. And the BRT 
includes the obstacle, but also additional states from which you cannot avoid getting into the obstacle. So it's kind of inevitable collision set. That's one way to think about it. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? No, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so to summarize Hamilton Jacobi reachability, it's a, um, um, it, or, or the advantage of Hamilton Jacobi reachability is a general and constructive method for the safety analysis of autonomous systems. We can apply it to a wide variety of non-linear autonomous systems. Um, interestingly, it not only provides a safety controller, but it also gives us the operation regime of that safety controller. For example, in this case, that safety controller's operation regime is this blue set over here. And finally, it accounts for the uncertainty in the system during the safety analysis, which is particularly important when we would deploy these systems in the real world, as I would show later. But going back to the main goal of this talk, which is the safety of learning-based systems, some key challenges still remain. Now, first of all, even though theory is quite general, computationally speaking, it is very hard to scale these methods beyond five or six dimensional system. And that's because um, if you recall, we need to solve this partial differential equation to compute this value function, which is generally sold over a grid in the state space of the system. And so the size of this grid and hence the computational requirements scale exponentially with the number of states, uh, which does not allow us to apply these or which really limits the practical applicability of these methods. And second, and perhaps more important, is that it's not immediately clear how to interface these methods with real world data and machine learning models, which is what we are primarily interested in in this talk. So to begin making progress on these challenges, we will lead into neural approximation methods. Now, I understand that it might be worrisome to use neural networks for safety critical systems like these, and I share that concern, and we will talk about it. But let's put guarantees on hold for a minute and think about how can we even structure the learning problem so as to rep so as to obtain good representation of our safety controller and safety value function. And then we will come back and talk about guarantees with these approximations. And so our key idea is to learn a neural approximation of the safety value function V over here, where we will use the Hamilton Jacobi ISEX PDE that I showed earlier as a signal for training this network. Now, specifically, this neural network takes as input the state and time of the system, and it outputs the corresponding safety value function at that state and time. And once we obtain this safety value function, we can synthesize the backward reachable tube as well as the safety controller using the same paradigms that I showed earlier. Going into a little bit more detail, we call this method DeepReach. DeepReach is a self-supervised learning method, which relies on the fact that the true safety value function must satisfy the hamilton jacobi isaac partial differential equation. And hence, the PDE violation error can be used as a signal to train the network. And so that's really how uh, we train the network. In each training iteration, we randomly sample some state and time. We propagate it through the, uh, through the neural network to obtain the value function, which we can then use to compute the PDE violation error. And then we back propagate from this loss function to optimize the neural network parameters. So essentially, over time, we are incentivizing the neural network to learn a more and more accurate representation of the safety value function. And there are two key advantages to deep reach over traditional safety analysis methods. Number one is that deep reach provides us a way to explicitly bake in my safety requirements during the training process itself in order to learn inherently safe controller from data. And second, neural representations are much easily scalable to higher dimensional systems, which allows us to synthesize safety controllers for a broader class of autonomous systems. And so we apply deep reach in the context of a number of high dimensional autonomy application. But before I talk about those applications, let's apply deep reach to a setting where we can actually also compute the ground truth safety value function so as to compare the quality of the loan solution. And um, one such application that we've been looking into is two aircraft collision avoidance problem. Here there is an evader vehicle in the blue, and there's a pursuer vehicle which we model as an uncertain or adversarial vehicle that is trying to actively collide with the blue vehicle. So you can think of this orange aircraft as uh, an aircraft whose behavior we don't know. Um, now this system, um, one way to model this system is in the relative, uh, relative space between these two aircrafts where the state would consist of the relative position between the aircraft as well as their relative heading. And here the failure set is given by any configurations of these two aircraft where they are, where they are in close proximity of each other. 
Okay, so let's compute the backward reachability for this system using deep reach. So once again, here I'm showing you the failure set in the state space of the system. Um, so this looks like a cylinder, which essentially corresponds to the relative position between the two aircraft being smaller than a particular threshold, meaning they are very close to each other. Now using deep reach, the value function computed is shown in the middle panel over here. The red corresponds to the region where the value function is smaller and the blue represents the value, value the regions where the value function is more positive. And the backward reachable tube, once again, can be obtained by looking at the states where the value function is negative, which in this case is given by this water slide looking red set over here. So let's spend 30 seconds talking about what this set means. And so for that, to visualize what this set means, I'm looking at a particular slice of the value function where the relative heading between the aircraft is pi by two. So essentially the vehicles are starting in a way so as to um, have a pi by two relative heading. And the black region over here represents the boundary of the backward reachable tube. Meaning that if the aircraft start at any state inside this black boundary, then no matter what blue aircraft does, the orange vehicle will be eventually able to force it into a collision. So if the orange vehicle is an adversarial agent, these are the set of states from which it will win. On the other hand, if we start outside this backward reachable tube, then no, ma no matter how hard the orange vehicle try, the blue vehicle will be able to escape the collision. So essentially from these states, blue vehicle has a strategy to avoid the collision at all times. Now, given the low dimensionality of this system, we can actually also compute the ground truth value function in this case, and that is shown in the rightmost panel over here. This ground truth value function can be found by explicitly solving that PDE. And you can see the value two value functions are quite close to each other. In fact, the mean square error in this case is below 10 to the power minus four, which indicates that the deep reach learns a very good approximations of the safety value function. Okay, but now let's apply deep reach to the context that we actually designed it for, which is high dimensional autonomous system. And so the first problem we considered is the three aircraft conflict resolution problem. Here we have two evader vehicles and one pursuer vehicle. Once again, pursuer vehicle is trying to actively collide with these evader vehicles and the evader vehicles are trying to actively avoid the collision. And so the failure set here is given by any configurations of these aircrafts where any uh, N2 vehicles are in close proximity with each other. Now, Given the high dimensionality of this problem, a direct computation of the backward reachable tube is actually not feasible in this case. So what folks often do in multi-agent coordination is that they compute the pairwise collision set between these vehicles and then take the union of that as an approximation of the overall BRT. And that is shown in the green region over here. But with deep reach, we can directly compute the high dimensional backward reachable tube. And that is shown in the pink over here. Now, what's interesting is that because of deep reach, we can actually capture some of the nuanced unsafe configurations of the system that we could not capture earlier because of the dimensionality issues or computational issues. And I'm showing you one such nuanced unsafe configuration here, where the orange vehicle is going after the blue vehicle. The blue vehicle is actually avoiding, is able to avoid a collision with the orange vehicle, but in the process of doing so, it cannot avoid a collision with the black aircraft on the top. So these three-way interactions between the vehicle is something that we could not capture earlier because of our computational limitation, but we can now do so using deep reach and actually safeguard against them. Um, we also applied this Sorry, work in the- uh, Samil, uh, just before you uh, jump onto this, uh, the next example, in this three aircraft uh, situation, uh, I'm very curious to know what is the distance uh, between the two or the three aircrafts in which the architecture comes into play. Because in the civil aviation code, whenever there is a, uh, the, your architecture system comes into play on both the aircrafts, which are on the collision course, then the code says that each one has to veer to, towards uh, own, own right, right side, not, not left hand side, right side. So my yeah. question to you is, what is the distance between the two aircrafts or three aircrafts when this architectural uh, issue comes uh, comes into play? Yeah, so um, so I think that the the uh, the distance that we defined between the two aircrafts, where sort of we consider it to be on the collision course, is um, is I think in this case uh, about 0.2 meters. 
So if they are within the 0.2 meters, um, um, that's uh, that's where we consider them in the collision course. Uh, and if I remember correctly, this 0.2 meter we derived using this five mile uh, separation radius requirement of FAA. It is, in it the is uh, FAA. It is about 1,000 feet uh, separation. Vertical. Yeah. So so that is in the vertical. So here we are not dealing with the vertical altitude. We are only looking at the cruising plane. Okay. Here. So so there is no altitude separation. We are only looking at the x y separation here. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are um, we also apply this work in the context of autonomous driving. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with Waymo. Um, so here, uh, essentially, the white vehicle is going in its lane, but it encounters a stranded vehicle. So this could be, for example, an Uber waiting in the lane or a trash truck which is blocking our lane. This happens actually quite frequently uh, when you do urban driving. And so in this case, the white vehicle needs to cross over to the other lane and then come back, but it needs to do so in a way so as to safely negotiate this transition with the oncoming traffic, in this case, the orange vehicle. Now we started with a nominal learning based controller to do this task um, and that, that performed well, except that it was not able to ensure safety in all situations. So here I'm showing you one such trace of that learning based controller, which fails to sort of safely negotiate this transition. But with deep reach, we can directly bake in safety requirements in the training process and learn safe controllers. And the behavior of that safe controller is what I'm showing over here. And what the safety controller does is that it actually pushes the white vehicle a little bit towards the stranded vehicle and make the orange vehicle swerve so that a clearance is formed between the two vehicles and they can cross each other safely. And once they cross each other, they go back to their nominal trajectories. But what's particularly interesting is the behavior of the safety controller automatically adapts to the behavior of the oncoming traffic. So for example, if the orange vehicle is coming really fast, what safety controller does is that it makes the white vehicle wait behind the standard vehicle, let the orange vehicle pass and then cross over. And if you think about it, um, this is how intuitively we will drive in such situations, except that now these behaviors emerge automatically out of the learning based controllers because we could bake in safety requirements within the learning process. And in our latest work, we have applied deep reach for, um, uh, for safe lagged locomotion. Here the, um, um, here the safety controllers um, um, enable the robot to safely navigate to its goal while switching between different walking patterns and, uh, and, uh, and avoiding a collision with the obstacle on its way. But what's particularly interesting is the robustness of this controller. So that's where that uncertainty aspect come into the picture, where you can see my student Shuang is pushing the robot around, trying to force it into a collision, but the safety controller is able to counteract, sometimes even by switching the walking pattern. Um, so example, you will see it crawling or going under, the, um, under this sort of um, tunnel type of environment in order to maintain safety. Yes, Homil. Uh, how did you? Uh, sorry, how how did you uh, train uh, the robot with the human? Like because you said your colleague is uh, trying to push it uh, or whatever it it is, but it is finding its own way. That means it must have been trained with the human uh, thing. So how did uh, you no, do that? Not really. So that's we we train it with some uncertainty in the system, right? So we uh, so we have a model of the robot. But then we add some uncertainty in the system. So in this case, the human aspect is captured by that uncertainty. So we don't model explicitly the human. We say that the, there could be some uncertainty in the system. And as it encounters that uncertainty, the safety controller reacts to that uncertainty. So it's a robust safety controller. Okay, thanks. Okay, now let me come back to one of the key questions about, um, about uh, these neural representations, which is, how can we ensure safety under these representations? So as such, neural network can make errors and the safe set provided by deep reach is only a candidate safe set, meaning that there could be actually be states inside this candidate safe set, which will drive the system to the failure set. So to begin making progress on these challenges, we are looking into probabilistic safety assurances for deep reach. Where our key observation is that the learned safety value function by deep reach also induces a candidate safe policy for the system, which we also call safety controller, which if I apply on the system should ideally achieve the same value that I'm trying to learn, because essentially this policy corresponds to the safety value function. 
So essentially the gap between the two safety value functions can be used as a signal to correct for the learning error. So more specifically, I'm interested in finding a bound on the maximum learning error delta. And once I know my learning error bound, I can correct my value function by that bound in order to obtain a conservative value function. Pictorially, what that means is that if the maximum learning error bound is delta, then if I look at any states beyond the this delta level, which is also called super delta level of the value function, then that state will remain safe under the induced safe policy. And hence, this green set can be given as a certified safe set for the system. Now, we have looked into a number of ways to compute this bound delta, but the one that I'm going to talk about today and that I'm excited about more generally is conformal prediction both because of its scalability, but also its ability to handle a wide variety of inputs. So more specifically, we will use conformal prediction to compute a high confidence bound on this learning error, which will then in turn allow us to provide probabilistic safety assurances. So let me provide a 30 second primer on what conformal prediction is, and then I will talk about how we can use that in the context of the bridge. So in conformal prediction, we are typically given a prediction model for example, a neural network that takes as input some that takes some input z and predicts um, some output y. We are often also given a calibration data set, which essentially provides us the ground truth output for a number of held um, or number of fresh or held out inputs. And the key goal of conformal prediction is to compute a bound on the learning error, which is essentially the gap between my predicted output and my ground truth output, which is sometimes also called the scoring function. And the way conformal prediction does that is that it essentially provides us this, uh, or, or given some confidence level epsilon, it provides us this Q hat, which serves as a high confidence bound on the learning error. So this Q hat is what we are after in conformal prediction. So let's see how we can apply that in the context of deep reach. In deep reach, our prediction model is essentially corresponds to the safety value function given the input state and time. We are also, we also have a calibration data set which corresponds to that rolled out value that I chatted about earlier, corresponding to a number of initial conditions. And once again, we are interested in finding a bound on the learning error. So using conformal prediction, we obtain this Q hat, which serves as a high confidence bound on delta. And ultimately what this gives us is a probabilistic safety coverage, where essentially any state beyond the Q hat level of the value function is safe with probability one minus epsilon, meaning that the probability of failure in this green region is below epsilon. And so the super Q hat level of the value function serves as a safe set for my system. And let me show that framework very quickly in the context of the multi-aircraft collision avoidance problem that I showed earlier. So here the yellow region corresponds to the BRT learned by deep reach, and the blue corresponds to the region or the correction learned by or computed using conformal prediction. In this case, the delta hat turns out to be 0.1. So we need to correct the value function levels by 0.1, which then gives us the green set over here, which is a certified safe set. In this case, epsilon is 0.001, which means that any state inside this green region is at least 99.9% .9 safe. So we can provide probabilistic safety assurances by doing that. Okay, so let me summarize this part of the talk. We talked about data-driven safety representations, which combine the rigor of traditional safety analysis method with the dynamic learning capabilities of AI. And the key advantage of these representations is, number one, um, they allow it to explicitly bake in safety requirements in the training process in order to learn inherently safe controllers from data. And two, um, they are much easily scalable to high dimensional systems so we can synthesize or learn safe controllers for a broader class of autonomous systems. Um, I was gonna next talk about how can we adapt these safety assurances online as, the, as things change in the uh, system or its environment. But just in the interest of time, let me skip some parts of the slide deck and then I'm gonna chat about, uh, sorry, give me one minute. So I'm going to skip some slides and reshare my screen. Okay, so um, I was going to chat about how we can update these assurances online, but in the interest of time, let me talk about um, how can we 
use the safety representation to stress test learning based systems and provide this and, and to find their safety critical failures. And then if I have time, I will come back to uh, updating safety assurances online. So we have been particularly looking at finding the failures of a vision based controller for two reasons. Number one, they are becoming quite ubiquitous in robotics. Um, and second, they particularly are challenging to analyze using traditional safety analysis methods because both of their high dimensionality, but also the complicated nature of, in, uh, of visual inputs such as RGB images. So let's mathematically pose the problem. We are given some system or robot with dynamics, again, F state X control U. At, at any state X, we essentially have a visual sensor this, that gives us the visual observation. So these could be RGB images or point clouds, which are then taken as input by a vision based controller to give the control commands to be applied on the robot. We are also given a simulator, which we can use to, um, to stress test this vision based controller. Now, the key goal that we have is to find these visual inputs I which then lead to the failure of the overall closed loop system. So that's what we are after. Now, our key idea is to pose the failure discovery problem as a reachability problem, and then use the BRT to find these visual failures. More specifically, we can concatenate the robot visual observations along with the vision based controller to obtain an equivalent state based policy for the robot. And so I can simplify my closed loop system as the robot in feedback with this equivalent state based policy. And in the first part of talk, we know how to find the failures of such closed loops, for example, by doing reachability analysis. Now, typically, when we are interested in finding failures, we compute this backward reachable tube, which is a set of all states from which the system will eventually steer into the failure region, despite best control action. And and mathematically, that is equivalent to solving this partial differential equation. Except that in this case, I'm not interested in all possible action. I'm just interested in a very specific control action, which is given by my learning based controller. So essentially, I can just simply modify my partial differential equation to just plug in that spe specific safety control or that specific learning based controller. But with this minor change, we can use all the tools that we discussed in the first part of the talk to compute the backward reachable tube of this vision based controller. And once we compute this backward reachable tube, the images seen by the robot along these failure trajectories will give us the visual failure inputs. So we apply this work in the context of an autonomous aircraft taxing problem. We did this work in collaboration with Boeing, where they designed a vision based controller that uses the images from the camera on the right wing of the aircraft to guide the aircraft towards the center line of the runway. So we are trying to push it towards the center line. But in the process of doing so, we don't want the aircraft to ever leave the runway. So that is the failure set in this specific case. And using the method that I just shown, we compute the backward reachable tube of this aircraft under this vision based control. Okay, so what we are looking at, again, the this region is the failure region. So it indicates we, the aircraft leaving the runway. The red region here corresponds to the starting configurations of the aircraft from which it will be eventually driven off the runway under the vision based controller. And on the other hand, the blue region corresponds to the states from which the aircraft will be able to guide towards the center line without leaving the runway. And here are some of the representative failure images that drives the aircraft off the runway. So let's take a look at one such image and see what's going on. So here I'm showing you that image in, in sort of uh, in, a, in a zoom zoomed in version. And on deeper analysis of this image, what we found is that the vision based controller actually confuses these runway markings with the center line of the runway, and then drive the aircraft towards this marking. But by the time it realizes that actually it's not the center line it's already too late, and the aircraft is already off the runway. So using this proposed framework, we can find such semantic failures of vision based controllers. And these are not just any failures of vision based controllers. These are precisely the failures then that then that lead to closed loop failures. So, for example, here I'm showing you the prediction error of the vision based controller for different states. 
the red corresponds to the regions with high prediction error and the blue corresponds to the region with low prediction error. And you can see there are a whole bunch of states which have very high prediction error, but they do not matter for the system safety. We are deep inside this blue set. On the other hand, there are states where the prediction error is really low, but that is enough to trigger a safety violation of the overall system. So clearly not all learning errors are equal from a robot safety viewpoint. And our framework is particularly targeting those learning errors that then lead to the closed loop safety violations. And not only that, we can actually find these failures as a function of the environment latents, such as time of the day. So here, for example, I'm showing you the failure set for different times of the day. And we can see the same state that was unsafe in the morning because of this runway marking is actually safe in the night, um, which is very counterintuitive if you think about it, because any vision-based controller generally degrades in performance as, um, as we go towards the night because of the low visibility. But in this particular case, that helps because this particular failure is being caused by a semantic <clears throat> issue where the vision-based controller is confusing these runway markings with the center line. But during the nighttime, it can't clearly see these runway marking and hence it does not cause a failure. Similarly, we can also find these failures as a function of the cloud conditions. So what happens when we are clear cloud conditions versus there's an overcast and so on and so forth. So using these methods, we can essentially collect our diverse sources of failures for a vision-based controller. Um, very quickly, let me just show another example we, where we also apply this framework in the context of uh, autonomous navigation in, in indoor environments. So we developed this uh, vision-based controller, which essentially takes the RGB image uh, from the onboard camera to output a waypoint for the robot, which is then tracked using an MPC controller under the hood. Uh, and this framework was trained entirely in simulation. Uh, but then we deployed it directly in the real world. And here is one uh, experiment video. Now you can see that even though the robot has never seen this environment before, it only using these first person RGB images to successfully navigate the robot through this very cluttered hallway with bikes on one side and cubicles on the other side um, and eventually steer it towards its goal. So using the proposed framework, we found a number of interesting failures of this vision-based controller, but in the interest of time, let me just highlight one of them. So what we found is that the convolutional neural network actually confuses the light colored surfaces with traversability. And that was very confusing at first, uh, but then when we, we analyzed it deeper, we found that all the training data that this convolutional neural network was trained on mostly consisted of the environment with light colored floors and dark colored walls. So CNN essentially learns a spurious correlation between light colored surfaces and traversability. So during the test time, when it encounters an environment where there are light colored walls, it actually thinks that it can go through it and collides. So once again, using the proposed framework, we can find such spurious correlation learned by CNN and hopefully safeguard against them. So, okay, so where are we going Kumail, with this? Uh, sorry, two questions, two quick questions. Uh, the first yes. one is uh, the architecture which you are, which you are using, is it modular in nature? So the, the architecture for which which part are you talking about? The architecture, the previous slide, uh, in, in which you are showing the yeah this this architecture is it modular yes. in nature? Yes, this is modular because the there is a perception module which only gives the high level decisions, and then there is a low level planning and control module. Um, so yes, it's modular in nature here. Okay, and the second uh, question which is coming to my mind is the robot which you are using. Uh, is it mm -hmm. always the case that it has been trained before or it can also go to an untrained uh, uh, environment? It is completely going to untrained environments. So for example, like, uh, as I mentioned, this framework was trained in simulation environments uh, from Stanford. And the video that I showed you is actually from Berkeley. So yes, it can completely go to, do, uh, to new environments. Great, thanks. Okay. So, so what I've talked so far, just to summarize, is how can we find various failures of a vision-based controller? Okay, so what are we, what are we go, where are we going with this? So using this vision-based failures, we can actually improve our vision-based controller. Um, so here, for example, one way to do so is by runtime monitoring. 
where we essentially take our failure data set to train an anomaly detector, which given a new image tells me what is the likelihood of this image being causing a failure. With this anomaly detector, we can actually use it during online operation for triggering a fallback controller. So for example, whenever an anomaly detector detects a failure, we can trigger a safe fallback controller for the system. Otherwise, we can use our learning-based controller. So here I'm um, showing you um, um, that framework, that anomaly detector framework in the context of a similar environment as before, where this aircraft was being confused by these runway markings. But now you will see that this anomaly detector flags these images as potential failures, which then trigger the fallback controller, which in this case simply lower the speed of the aircraft a little bit. And once it passes this pedestrian crossing, the learning based controller can take over again and um, steer the system towards the center line. We can, of course, also take this failure data set to incrementally train our vision based controller. Um, and that, as you would expect, would improve the performance of the system as well. So we can do model refinement. Okay, so let me quickly summarize. Um, the key question that we are interested in is how can we design autonomous systems that can leverage the capabilities of modern machine learning methods while also maintaining safety. And towards that goal, we have developed a continual safety assurance framework that integrates safety in different stages of the learning process. We talked about deep reach, which integrates the safety during the design time. We unfortunately didn't get a chance to talk about the operation time. And then we can actually improve the safety over the system's life cycle by finding their failures and using them to improve the design. We also talked about neural safety representations that allow us to operationalize this continual safety assurance framework. But in my head, these are still just the baby steps towards developing truly safe learning based autonomous systems. Um, a lot needs to be done to scale these methods to the complexity and nuances of the real world autonomous systems. Um, but let me talk just very briefly about some of the technical challenges that I'm particularly excited to work on in the near future. So for design time, we talked about deep reach, which is already a step forward in terms of incorporating safety requirements during the, during the training process. But safety is not the only objective system has. So one of the key questions that we are interested in is how can we harness the power of the safety signal while also optimizing for other performance objectives that the system might have. Similarly, so far we have mostly focused on the safety controller aspect of the safety signal, but the safety analysis also provides us the information about the states that are critical from the safety viewpoint. And this information can be used by a learning agent to strategically guide its exploration towards these states in order to learn more robust and general behaviors. So that is something that we are also focusing on in our group. Now, once we design safe and performance systems, we deploy these systems. And one of the key challenges here is to figure out which of these deployment conditions might be anomalous for a learning based component where they might behave erratically. So that's the problem of anomaly detection and failure detection. And as we gather information about these anomalies, we might need to adapt the system behavior in order to maintain safety. And so here we are focusing on how can we dynamically construct these safe regions and the safety controllers based on the environment data, including high dimensional observations such as RGB images and point clouds. And finally, as we learn about systems failures, the dream is to just refine the learning component so that it never fails again in a similar situation. But unfortunately today, that process doesn't go as expected. So for example, I talked about how we can find the failures of this vision-based controller for autonomous taxing, but, uh, and then using those failures, we refined our neural network. And as expected, that improved the performance of the neural network in various regimes. So the, the brown is the new backward reachable tube and the um, gray is the old BRT. And you can see how the size of the BRT is shrinking. But it also surprisingly introduced new safety failures in the other parts of the operation regimes where it was doing fine earlier. So one of the key question is how to refine the learning components today, specifically deep learning components without exposing new safety risks in the other parts of their operation domain. And finally, how can we use this failure data set that we have mined to guide at scale testing of the systems in simulation so as to reduce the real world testing. 
So these are some of the directions that we have been working on uh, in collaboration with a number of companies in the context of a variety of different applications. We have been particularly working with Boeing um, in order to improve the vision-based controller that they have designed um, in a monotonic fashion, so without exposing new safety risk. Uh, the one collaboration that I'm particularly excited about and we have started lately is with NASA JPL for their upcoming lunar mission Endurance, where, this, where they have a lunar rover that needs to autonomously traverse on the lunar surface for 2,000 kilometers day and night. And, and the challenge that we are working on here is how can we enable this rover to autonomously update its safety control online as it gathers more information about the lunar surface from the onboard cameras. And finally, we've been also working with Wayman and NVIDIA to find the failures of their autonomy stacks and guide at scale testing of these cars. So with that, uh, I would like to thank my collaborators as well as funding agencies who have supported our research and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, let's open the stage for questions. You can either unmute and ask or write in the chat and I can read for you. Yeah, uh, Yule, uh, I have got uh, three questions uh, for Somil. Uh, Go firstly, ahead, brother. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and it's a great talk, uh, Somil. Uh, first question is, uh, you know, I was just trying to think how to reduce the margin of BRT so that, you know, the responsive uh, aspect is faster. That was the first question. The second question is, in the case of drone, you have shown the obstacle as the ceiling and the floor, but there could be obstacle in between also. So how do you uh, tweak the convolutional uh, neural network to accommodate that? And of course, uh, the third one you said about Boeing missing the center line because the instrument landing system for any approaching aircraft to the runway has got a particular envelope, both uh, vertical and horizontal. But despite that, once your architecture comes into play, how it interferes and overrides in a situation that uh, there is a chance for missing the center line of the runway. So these are the three questions, Samit, please. Okay, uh, let me, uh, I'm trying to recall these three questions. I'm gonna to try to answer them one by one. So your first question was, how do we reduce the margin of the back, uh, backward reachable tube so as to be most responsive? So backward reachable tube actually provides a continuous measure of safety. Um, what I mean by that is that the backward reachable tube provides you a set of all safety control inputs, not just one safety control input. So if, for example, you are in, you are a little bit outside the backward reachable tube, it gives you full flexibility to use whatever controller you want to use. So the only time it sort of um, reduces your reactivity is when you're exactly at the boundary of the backward reachable tube. And even there, it gives you a whole set of control inputs. Uh, that's a work that we are not presenting here, but we can explicitly characterize the set of safe control inputs, and you can pick any of these control inputs that is best for your performance objectives. So, so that's how we can use BRT for reactivity. And your second controller was about what if there are obstacles in between ceiling and floor? So that's no problem. The essentially L of X could be any general function which is negative inside your obstacle. So if you have more obstacles, we just need to appropriately define L of X function. In fact, um, so let me just quickly show you one example where we do that, that I did not get a chance to chat about. And then I'm gonna move to a third question. There we go. So, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. So, so for example, this is the this is a, another scenario, right? There, the drone is going towards its goal, but there are obstacles in between, um, and we can we have to just redefine our L of X, but we can do so, um, and the same tools can be used. And uh, finally, to your landing question, so I think we haven't yet thought about the interaction between the landing and taxiing because Boeing is not yet brave enough, I think, to try a vision-based controller for landing the aircraft completely. Uh, so we are only doing the taxiing here, um, and uh, and and so we haven't thought so much about the interaction between the landing and taxiing. But I completely agree that uh, essentially, as we switch between different modes of operation for an aircraft, we have to really think what this interaction means for the overall safety of the system. And uh, finally, Samuel, uh, uh, one thing which uh, comes to my mind is uh, 
how do you accommodate the um, OOD, that is the out of uh, description, uh, into your algorithm while designing this particular architecture? So that's the thing. I mean, I, um, I mean, this could be a controversial opinion here, and I'm being recorded. But, um, but I, I do believe that uh, I mean, we cannot account for all out of distribution during the, during the design time, which is precisely why I believe we need a cycle rather than a state, right? Because it's like the system will operate out there and we will eventually and inevitably encounter new situation that we never thought about during the design time. So we, rather than accounting for out of distribution during design time, my philosophy is that as we encounter out of distribution, how can we improve the design so as to uh, you know, make this system more and more competent over time? Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Subrata, for the questions. Any other question for Somin? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me, Sam? Oh, go ahead, uh, Eugene. Uh, yeah, thanks for a great talk. I have a question that uh, you mentioned that um, in the last part of your talk, you mentioned that you can we can detect the failure the failure set by your method, and uh, some of the failures actually are caused by the semantic error by the learning based controller. So hey. I'm thinking about is there a way to automatically detect these kind of semantic errors and distinguish them from other kind of errors and it might be very helpful for the design of the controller right the, yeah that's a very good control that's a very good question uh, i mean our framework only tells us whether a particular image is a failure or not what it does not give us is the underlying causal reasoning for that failure meaning meaning uh, is it like the center line that's causing the failure is it the runway marking that's causing the failure so currently we are doing it manually but one direction that we've been looking into is how we can use the generative AI to actually uh, help with that analysis. So what we are doing is we can actually alter the different part of the images and see which of those parts matter for actually the failure. And so that can give us some signal onto which aspects of this image is precisely causing the uh, convolutional neural network to cause a failure. So that might help with that analysis a little bit, but currently it's being done manually. That's a very good question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jun. Any other question for Somin? Uh, does it seem so? I, I have maybe a question. Uh, I would be interested in your, have you thought about the setting in which you have multiple agents, some of which using this kind of tools, some of them which are just, let's say, reacting to the technologies uh, and uh, how that's a, do you that's, see this working there? That's a very good question, right? And I mean, it goes to the next layer of design, right? Which is, which is like, okay, so if you're given like 100 of agents, some of them are gonna be reactive, some of them are gonna be adversarial, some of them are gonna be collaborative. So we haven't yet reasoned about, uh, so we are assuming that that level of reasoning is already given to us. Um, and, and, um, and I think that uh, one of the things we are looking into right now is a, given a multi-agent scenario, which of the agents matter for my decision making? So you can, because you can imagine like some of the agents may not even matter for what decision I take, right? In a multi-agent setting. So that's one thing we are looking into. And two, can we find the intent or the reactivity of these agents by looking at their data? And then sort of, that will be like the first layer of high level decision making, which is then gonna be incorporated into, uh, into, the, into the low level decision making, which is what we are focusing on right now. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. I look forward to seeing results there. It's yeah, exciting. and it would be great to chat with you as well. I'm sure you think yeah, about yeah, this yeah. a lot too. Yeah, yeah, we should we should chat offline, definitely. Uh, all right, I don't think there are other questions for Somil, but I think you left your email uh, somewhere yes. in the slides so people can, can reach out. I can also put my email quickly here, if that helps. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you very much again, Somil, for the great talk. Uh, it was thank you, thank you, Joel, for having you. Me. Yeah, great and to see you. you all. Oh yeah, great to see you. And and thank you all for joining. See you all next week for the next talk. Bye bye.